I'm Diane Kresh, Director of Arlington Public Library and host of Arlington Reads 2021. Sponsored by the Friends of the Arlington Public Library, Arlington Reads brings authors and leading influencers to our community to speak about literature and the important issues of our time. Our theme this year is Food for Thought, offering perspectives on a range of political, cultural, and global issues, from climate change and threats to democracy, to Black Lives Matter, and hashtag Me Too. How will I raise my son to be different? Asked Washington Post investigative reporter Emma Brown, then at home nursing her six-week-old son when the Me Too movement erupted. In search of answers, Brown traveled the nation through urban and rural towns, both affluent and distressed, and interviewed hundreds of people, educators, parents, coaches, researchers, men, and boys, to understand the challenges boys face and how to address them. The result, the seminal to raise a boy, classrooms, locker rooms, bedrooms, and the hidden struggles of American boyhood. What Brown uncovered was shocking. 23% of boys believe men should use violence to get respect. 22% of an incoming college freshman class said they had already committed sexual violence. 58% of young adults said they've never had a conversation with their parents about respect and care in sexual relationships. Men are four times more likely than women to die by suicide, and nearly four million men experience sexual violence each year. The book is engaging, thoughtful, and well-researched, and pulls no punches in describing the many ways our society, culture, and our schools have failed boys. As the mother of two boys who are now 28 and 32, I realized I too had failed to have some of those aforementioned conversations, a failure I sought to correct before our interview with Emma Brown. It's never too late to sit down with those you love and talk about how to be in the world. Emma Brown is an investigative reporter at the Washington Post. In her life before journalism, she worked as a wilderness ranger in Wyoming and a middle school math teacher in Alaska. Emma was raised in Arlington and now lives with her husband and two children in Washington, D.C. I am joined today by Anita Friedman, Director of Human Services and also the mother of two boys. Please welcome Emma Brown. Welcome, Emma Brown, to Arlington Reads. So let's talk about your extremely important book that I had the pleasure of reading. I'm thrilled for you because, you know, full disclosure, I worked for many, many years with your mother, Margaret Brown, uh, absolutely superb librarian, and who helped me for a number of years with Arlington Reads. So it's really a thrill to have you here on our series. So you've written this terrific book about raising boys uh, I raised two boys, and I wish I had this book uh, 20, 25 years ago, because as I was reading it, I was saying, oh, this would have been useful to know. And uh, in, it, with the spirit of it's never too late, I did have conversations with each boys, uh, each boy rather, this week as I was reading your book and uh, getting their reactions. So at certain points, I may bring up a little bit of what they had to say, which uh, much of which was very new to me. So, and Anita also, Anita Friedman from DHS is uh, co-hosting with me and she also has two young men and uh, we can talk about that as well. So why don't we start at the beginning? Why did you write the book and where would you like to begin the conversation? Well, thank you for having me. It's so it's great for me to be here because Arlington Public Library is a library I grew up with as a kid and uh, and so it feels like coming home to, to be able to speak at Arlington Reads. So thank you. Um, I, so I, I'm a reporter at the Washington Post and was home on maternity leave with my son when the first Harvey Weinstein stories broke. And of course I was scrolling through those stories as I was nursing my baby and then all of the stories that came after that. 
thinking about what does this mean for me as the as a mother of a of a new baby boy? Um, how am I going to raise my son? And um, um, so I will start there with a read a little bit from the introduction of the book about about uh, about where this book took me. Um, I'm embarrassed to admit that I had never given much thought to how boys learn how to be boys until that moment in late 2017, sitting at home with my chubby, cooey, cooing infant son, reading about the wrongdoings of men. These men had been infants once too, and then they had grown up. For me, raising a boy feels a little like traveling in a foreign land. It was different with my daughter. When I gave birth to her three years before my son was born, I had no idea how to be a mother. But after decades of navigating life as a woman, I knew unequivocally what I wanted for her. My husband and I named her Juniper after the hardy trees that cling to the sides of mountains. I wanted her to see herself as capable of anything, constrained by none of the old limits on who women must be and how they must move through the world. She could play with trucks and dolls. She could wear dresses and overalls. She could be an astronaut or a nurse. She could be fierce and funny and loving and steely spined. I am strong and fearless, I taught her to say, when she was two, as she hesitated on the playground, her lips quivering as she considered crossing a rope netting bridge strung 10 feet above the ground. There was nothing premeditated about that little sentence. It just appeared on my tongue, distilling what I wanted her to be and how I hoped she would think of herself. When we reached the far end, she threw her arms in the air and crowed, I am strong and fearless. I had no such pithy motto for my son, August. Reminding a boy to be strong and fearless seemed unnecessary and maybe even counterproductive, fortifying a stereotype instead of unraveling it. What could I give him to help him ignore the tired old expectations of boys, to understand the limitlessness of his life's possibilities in the same way I had wanted Juniper to see the limitlessness of hers? I had no idea. I didn't know how to help him resist the stresses and stereotypes of boyhood, because I had never grappled with the fact that boys face stresses and stereotypes at all. So I will stop there and just say that this book that began as questions about, uh, you know, that grew kind of out of the Me Too awakening in this country turned into a something broader about uh, me coming to understand that while I had always kind of thought it was easy to be a boy, it really is not. And boys face all kinds of challenges that are just as um, sort of poisonous to them as the stereotypes that girls face as they're growing up. Right. Uh, that was one of the things that struck me about the book. I mean, I grew up in a different generation. I'm the eldest of four, the only girl, three younger brothers. And there were very clear definitions of what was for girls and what was for boys. And I, I thought I did a pretty good job of um, throwing that aside when I had uh, the two boys of my own. Uh, but I realized in reading your book that there were many things that I sort of just kind of skipped over. And one of them was uh, the amount, the degree to which boys are subjected to bullying and harassment, uh, some of which can be very uh, violent and deadly. And tell me about your how you were able to uncover some of those stories. Yeah, you know, we say boys will be boys sometimes as a, a sort of um, excuse for the uh, the ways that boys can mistreat girls or men can mistreat women. But it's also something we say to kind of shrug off violence against boys as if it's something that is acceptable or normal for boys to experience as they're growing up, which I think is is um, my eyes were open to in the reporting of this book. And I focused in particular on the um on sexual violence against boys and this hidden problem that uh, I was astonished to learn about. So there's a famous study that suggests that as many as one in six boys is sexually assaulted before he reaches 18. Yeah. And you know, it's just something we don't talk about or hear about um, unless we're, you know, sometimes uh, when there's a scandal, right? Like the Catholic Church or Boy Scouts of America, but um, uh, that kind of sexual violence against boys can come in lots of different forms, just as it can against girls and women. So boys can face violence from their peers, both boys and girls. Um, they can face uh, sexual violence or sexual abuse from older women. And so, you know, why do we not see this? I think it's in part because it's so shameful for boys to um, admit, you know, boys are told to be strong and be uh, not not show weakness. And so it's so shameful for boys to admit if they've been violated. But also, I think we as adults are kind of blind 
to what boys go through because we've made assumptions that they are not victims, that boys are perpetrators and so on. And so part of working on this book for me was kind of having the, those assumptions stripped away. Right. And you, you describe an incident. Uh, I'm sorry, Anita, did you want to break in? No, no, go ahead. I, I, I was interested to, to talk about, you know, growing up as a feminist. I don't know, Diane, you grew up probably in the same era, time that I did. And, you know, being influenced by women's lib. And then I even worked in Latin America and what was called women in development, you know, promoting women's. But I think I really internalized messages from the feminist movement that, you know, men were largely perpetrators um, against women and that, the, you know, the principal thing one had to, to be aware of is, um, you know, that angle of the of the of the interaction to, you know, to basically think of them as, you know, these um power structures and and dynamics that you had to fight off and and that uh, and not have a nuanced view on masculinity at all you know so i was very interested the way you know you break down the nature nurture issue that really we 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 have this belief that testosterone is driving you know a lot of what's the, the masculinity and the toxic masculinity but really, it's a lot of the the nurture part, you know. Mm -hmm. And you say more about, you know, how how you think we reinforce this nurture of the of the male masculine, you know, framework. Yeah, well, I think that this is, a, you know, related to what we we're just talking about with a sort of hiddenness of abuse of boys. Um, the because it's all about how we how we how we see boys so much of how they then grow up to see themselves. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I wrote in the book about the, um, that, that it's nature and nurture. It's, it's never as, as simple as one or the other. It's really both. But I think the main takeaway for me from looking at what scientists have learned about differences and similarities between, um, uh, boys and girls is that when you're, if you have a child born with a certain set of genitalia, you don't know who they're going to be based on that, right? You don't, th there's so much overlap, like there might be slight differences between, on average, between boys and girls, but there's so much overlap in the variation between boys and girls that you just don't know. And that the, the, I think the best thing that I can do as a parent for my child is to give them access to everything, give them access to the best of femininity and the best of masculinity of what we have traditionally called feminine and masculine anyway, um, in terms of interests and passions and, you know, uh, also qualities like caring and leadership. I mean, these things are, we have put in boxes of masculine and feminine, but, um, uh, my takeaway was that we, you know, children, children grow up. One, one scientist said to me, it's kind of like language, you know, we're born, our brains are born with the ability to learn any language. It's just what we're exposed to. And, uh, you know, we, we feed from boys from the time they're tiny, a lot of messages about how they're supposed to be and who they're supposed to be. Um, and if we could just open that up a bit and give them access to, um, to all the spectrum of being um i th think that there's a lot of evidence that it would be healthier for them um both in terms of physical health mental health and emotional health well when i was talking to my older son he neither of my boys was what i would call an alpha male i mean they were sort of more nerdy and interested in games and intellectual things and reading and all that and the older boy in particular and i didn't learn this until this week uh, was aware of a phenomenon of looking a certain way in high school and you had to be looking like a Chad. And of course, I'm only thinking of hanging Chads, which is something <laughs> else. But, but it was like the archetype of the good looking, athletic, and if you weren't a Chad, like, don't even bother. And he said it was reinforced by media and social media and conversations and other kids. And I had I had no idea. And when we talked a little bit more about, well, did you talk about feelings and were there outlets where you could talk about, I'm free to be me? He said, no. I, he said, all we ever got was anatomical 
descriptions of how sex is supposed to work and the differences between girls, boys, men, women. And he said nobody ever had conversations about how to be in the world and how to create my own identity. And I, I just felt so sad because he never talked about any of that with me and I didn't know he was struggling. Um, so t talk a little, I mean, how do you, it, like, it's never too late probably to initiate the conversation, but how do you get it going if the boys are not in environments where that's happening either in the school system or in the environment they're growing up in? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I'm not a parenting expert. So I wrote this book as a, a journalist trying to understand the world my son was gro going to grow up in and what that meant for me as a parent. And I think one thing I learned from talking to researchers who study boys and how boy, boys grow up is that, yes, they they are in a world where, and, and from talking to boys themselves, is they go out in the world and they have to put on a set of armor often to kind of make it through because that's what they're they're expected to be tough. They're not expected to share their feelings um, or, or articulate their emotions, you know, in the same way sometimes that girls are. And, and that, that, so we as parents need help, I think, from the institutions that are helping to raise our boys to create those opportunities at school, on sports teams, you know, at faith institutions. Um, and then, but, but let's set that aside for a minute and talk about just inside our own homes. I think um, you know, I learned that we as parents have just incredible power to create a place where our sons can talk to us about what is actually on their minds, where they know that they can be safe, they can be themselves and be safe and be loved. Um, and that way, like when they have to put on the armor and go out and kind of go into the world, they know they can always come back and be themselves and like come back to that home base and therefore not lose touch with that person, that person, you know, who is their real authentic self. And so uh, that's how that's how I've come to think about it as a parent of a now almost four year old um, is if I can give him, you know, if I can give him that space where he always knows he can be himself, then he won't lose that self. Right. Anita, did you have similar? Did you have any conversations with either of your boys about these things? Well, I did. And I think, you know, I mean, I have a very close relationship with my boys. They have confided a lot in me over the years. Some people, have, you know, have looked at it as a little bit strange. You know, really, even friends have commented, "Why do you, why do your sons talk to you so much?" You know, like that's <laughs> something. But you know, an interesting thing about this whole um, bullying, which one of my sons did, was very much exposed to throughout his life in Arlington schools. Um, we lived in, in Latin America when they were little. So my older son, Gabriel, was called Gabby when he was in Latin America up until eight, grade three. Because that's what you call a Gabriel, you call him a Gabby. Well, when he came to the United States, that became unacceptable. And we even had a teacher uh, in the elementary school where he was who said, you cannot let your son be named Gabby anymore. You must change it to Gabe. And that he, he cites it as like a really definitive kind of moment in his life where he had to reckon with his personality, you know? And uh, I never thought of it that deeply, but now I'm thinking to myself, what did, what did, what happened, you know, there in that? Um, but I did want to mention, put a plug in here for Arlington County because uh, we have a project called Arlington Transforming Masculinity as part of Project Peace. And we have actually started working with athlete groups in the different high schools, um, creating Arlington Athletes of Action and Men of Respect uh, because of that culture in, you know, high schools and middle schools where there's that, you know, group think of, you know, we are masculine, we are the the, the the athletes and we dominate this, you know, the social scene and we can, you know, um, and so we're, we're doing these um, youth participation in all eight Arlington public high schools and creating uh, peer advocates so that there'll be people who can talk to each other um, when they, when they want to disclose something about sexual or dating violence. So just wanted to put a plug in for, for that. 
You know what you said about your son and uh, being called Gabby, and then and then you being told he should call he should call himself Gabe. It makes me think about all of the ways in which parents face this tension between wanting to embrace, you know, your your child and let them be who they are, and then also want to wanting to protect them from teasing and bullying that they will that they sort of you know are exposed to if they if they don't conform to what's expected. And I th- I I talked to a lot of dads who felt that really intensely as well, having grown up as boys and having kind of experienced that kind of pressure to fit in um, and knowing what sort of lies in wait for some in some communities for boys who don't fit in. Um, so the dads, I think, are caught in in particular caught in this position of understanding what what the um, consequences can be for kids who don't conform. And and then on the one hand, and then really wanting many dads wanting to embrace their sons for whoever they are on the other and kind of navigating that tension is a is a tough thing. Yeah. You also talk a lot in the book about the absence of sex education. And um, I certainly wouldn't advocate for the sex education that I got in my day. Uh, But I'm just, I'm curious, um, what's going on? Like, why is it disappearing? I think at precisely the moment when it's needed the most. Yeah, I was, I covered, I mean, I was a middle school teacher and then I covered education for years at the Post. And I, yeah, and I wasn't aware of how, much sex education had sort of evaporated out of public schools since 2000, um, which is according to the CDC survey data um, of schools around the country. And there's no there's no real clear answer. I think one um, one hypothesis that was floated to me in my research was that that's the year that No Child Left Behind passed and schools became uh, accountable for their performance in math reading and writing. And, and, you know, we know that over the, over in the ensuing years, there was such a focus on those subjects that in some, in some communities, social studies, science, and other sort of what were come, came to be seen in some places as extras fell off. So that could be one thing. And because it, it's not just like controversial subjects that, uh, that are getting left out, right? These are really basic things like puberty, teaching children what's happening to their bodies as they get older. Um, even messages about abstinence, you know, fewer schools are, are sort of teaching um, even that. So I think, um, so it's evaporating, right? And you said right at the moment it's needed most. And that in part, I think, is because of the explosion of free online pornography um, right. that, that can be very violent. It can be really degrading to women. And there's you know research I cite in my book that says if, if people who are watching boys who are watching violent pornography frequently are more likely then to become um, to to uh, to commit sexual violence against somebody else. So we have boys who are sort of not getting guidance at school. Other research showing a lot of parents aren't talking to their boys about consent or about respectful sexual relationships. And that vacuum then is being filled by what boys see on the screen. And so I talked to one young man who was in high school when I met him, and he had been watching pornography since he was in fifth grade. You know, his friends told him to check out Pornhub, and he did. Um, And he, he, I met him through an after-school program that he was in, like a peer leadership program that focused on helping young people learn how to talk to other people about dating violence and consent. And in this this program outside of his school was the first time he really learned what consent was. And, and he was so glad that he had because he said, you know, before he became sexually active, he said, because he said without that, he thought that the way that you deal with another person, if you want to have sex with them, is you just have sex with them. Uh, that's how it works. And that was the message he had gotten from pornography. So I think, you know, we... Um, we as parents and as communities also, as schools and communities, need to be aware that young people are seeing pornography younger than you may think, younger than you may like, but it, it's happening. And um, and so if we're not stepping up and giving them guidance, um, then we're, we're sort of leaving them, putting them in a position where, that I believe is not really fair to them. You know, it's, we're not teaching young people the skills and the communication skills that they need to have safe and respectful relationships, safe for themselves, safe for their partners, or kind of setting them up. Yeah. Uh, Anita, you're nodding your head a lot. Oh, sorry. I I tend to do that. But um, (laughs) see, (laughs) I was thinking because what you were saying, Emma, was really true. The uh, health education really was combined with PE 
when the cuts were made and you know uh, and there was an emphasis on standardized test achievement and SOLs. So even in Arlington Public Schools, there are no real separate health education teachers. Mm -hmm. I think I think Yorktown is the only one that has one. So you have PE teachers who are supposed to do the health ed right, and, right. It, and it gets very short changed. So then you have groups like ours, like Project Peace and Doorways for Women and Families and Arlington nonprofits that come in and try and supplement um, the education. So last year we had something called the Consent Summit. Hmm. It was a day long, um, you know, it was because we were in coronavirus. We had a virtual meeting on different topics related to consent. And so just it was really well attended by teens. So allowing people to speak about, you know, what consent means, how they've experienced it in their life and creating these spaces where young people can can speak with adult mentors is, is so important. Um, and un unfortunately, it sometimes has to be done outside of the school system because there's, there's no space. Right. You know? That's good, actually a good segue, the, the issue of consent, because Emma, you talk a lot about how no can be communicated in a variety, like the, the, the boy doesn't need to hear just no to stop, that there are lots of other cues that the that the boy can get to, to end a particular uh, encounter. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, as I traveled around uh, to different communities, you know, learning about um, how consent and sex education are being taught, sort of over and over again, I saw that it was being boiled down to either no means no or yes means yes to these really sort of simple, um, simple mottos, uh, which don't really do our kids any favors because that's not really how people communicate, basically. Um, you know, there's research showing, for example, that boys believe, you know, they're taught, no means no. Well, boys, a young man said to me, uh, a college student said to me, you know, we're taught no means no, so that, that means we need to get the girl to say yes. So if we're not, if we're just saying no means no, and we're not talking about all the power dynamics that happen in a relationship and all the coercion that can happen, then we're kind of, we're leaving aside reality. Um, and so I started to say there's research showing that boys, um, high school boys tend to believe that they, if they don't hear a no, then that's a, that means consent. Whereas girls will say, well, sometimes my silence is consent and sometimes my silence is is no and that is you know that can be confusing for boys except that we as human beings are really good communicators um, we're really good communicators about lots of things um, about social invitations for example and you can tell if you're paying attention if someone's made uncomfortable or doesn't really want to come to the party that you invited them to right and so if we're teaching boys to not just listen for a no but really Listen uh, and look at the look at the body language that this that your partner is giving you. Listen to the clues. Um, they don't. They have the skills that they need. They're not like broken when it comes to communicating. As long, but what we need to do, I think, is set the expectation that communication happens in lots of different ways. And if you're not sure what the person you're with wants, um, you should ask. And if you can't ask, if it's too uncomfortable, then assume the answer is no and let the other person take the initiative. Well, and you gave a very um, lengthy example in the book of the young woman who dated the uh, comedian um, Ansari, mm -hmm. uh, and about the, their encounter, and sometime later she revealed really how it felt under the circumstances. and. It, you know, and she got a lot of mixed reactions, people who were very like, what was your problem? Why didn't you walk away versus uh, some other? And, and, I, and I, I found myself judging when I was reading the story I'm, and I'm thinking, and I, again, I'm a lot older, but I said, well, why didn't she just walk away? And the point you were making is it's really more complicated than that. And even if intellectually, you know, well, that's what I need to do. Um, it doesn't always happen that way. So can you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, I mean, I think we are programmed as human beings to be polite to one another and to try to be, you know, smooth things over. And so uh, what she said to me about that situation was what do people wanted me to scream and run out of his apartment. You know, he was an established star. She was 
just out of college, 20 something, not a star, you know, <laughs> no, unknown. And so she was in a situation where, you know, he had a lot more power than she did. She didn't want to, she didn't want to, um, uh, you know, make the situation, uh, uncomfortable or make him feel bad or, or turn it into a big dramatic thing. She just wanted him to listen to what she was saying, which was, I don't want to do this right now. I'm really uncomfortable, um, you know, moving his hand away from her. Like she felt like those were signs that if he were paying attention, he would have, he would have, uh, if he were paying attention or if he had cared, she didn't really know what was going on in his head. Right. right. Um, it wouldn't have been so hard for him to see that she was really uncomfortable. Well, one of the other points too that you made in relating that story was that she needed help just saying no in general, and that in her personal life, not just in dating situations, but in her professional life, learning how to say no, practicing and pushing back. And it goes back to your point about communication. We all, in theory, know how to communicate, but but we don't. But there's a technique, and there's a skill set, and there's a uh, language that we have to get better at. And the only way to get better at is is to practice. Absolutely, and I think. Um... It's tempting to say, you know, because I, I admit I have this problem with, with, you know, saying something that may make somebody else uncomfortable in my personal life. I think that's a challenge for me. It's tempting to say, oh, that's because I'm taught as a woman or as a girl to be, sure. to be, um, make everybody else feel comfortable around me. But I also spoke with young men, a young man from, I believe it was MIT, who told me, you know, he had trouble saying no to a, a young woman who was pursuing him because he didn't want to be awkward or make her feel bad. And so I don't know somehow we're giving our, our we're not giving our kids, um, boys and girls permission to be honest with their um, or, or yeah, or, or teaching them how important it is to be honest and forthright, um, just as we're teaching them to listen to what the other person in their in their partnership is saying to them. Right. Anita, did you want to uh, chime in? Well, I just, you know, having having these two young men who've grown up in this um, you know, pressure culture, I think, is what it, I call it, especially in this Arlington, you know, the overachievement is right. through the roof, which is also tied, I think, to the white privilege, you know, um, because, um, you know, having young white men and you're sort of in this uber wealthy environment here where everyone is sort of wanting their child to be the uh, you know the travel team and the ivy league and whatever else we are aspiring to have, did you notice i was interested to see have you seen anything different in terms of this dynamic of of um sort of male identity being so defined between ethnic groups or racial groups or how does that interplay with with this issue one thing I thought was fascinating, there's a group, a research group at Johns Hopkins University that's leading a global study of gender among 10 to 14 year old boys and girls all over the world. And what they're finding is that there is this kind of global script about how girls are supposed to be and how boys are supposed to be. So despite our many differences between cultures, that there is this general idea that girls are supposed to be submissive and beautiful and boys are supposed to be strong and tough and um, not show weakness and sexually dominant and so on. And that they're also finding that, that, that those sort of strictures are loosening more quickly for girls than they are for boys. Um, that, so that is something that seems, um, you know, to be happening sort of on a, a scale that, that, um, beyond sort of that transcends lots of our differences around the world. But I do think that there are differences, uh, between communities in the in in our country, um, between there I think there are differences between racial groups and ethnic groups, and also d depending on the community you grow up grow up in, and sort of the political dynamics in your own community, uh, and the um, openness to thinking uh, differently about gender and about gender norms. So. Um, you know, I there there was a young man I spoke to who is in college, who's black, who was explaining to me that, you know, I, in the book um, I use a term that was uh, sort of born of the pro-feminist men's movement called the man box. So like these like set of expectations that boys have to fit inside, 
And this young man felt those, he felt that the, all of those expectations, you know, you got to be tough, you got to be strong, but he felt like the box was even smaller for him as a black boy, because if he, he had to be extra tough and extra strong. And when he, you know, liked to play, he liked art and he liked to um, bright colors and he wore his hair long. He got called gay and he got called white at his school. They called him a gay white boy. Um, so I think, you know, he definitely, he did, he felt like he faced sort of an additional layer um, of, of expectations about who he was supposed to be because of his race. Right. And in that chapter on racism and trauma, you, you speak also about boys coming from uh, tougher environments adopting this sort of machismo in order to feel safe. Like if, if I'm going to present this way, nobody will mess with me, but then it leads to other trauma. You know, you're shot and then you're recovering from that. Can you talk a little bit more about the intersectionality? I'm a boy, I already have issues, and then I'm a, a, a black a boy or a boy of color. Well, yeah, in, in communities where there's a lot of violence, um, you know, being choosing your masculinity, your form of masculinity is can be related to choosing survival. Um, so being tough and being able to kind of, you know, to avoid becoming a target um, uh, is, you know, it's not as simple as just telling boys like share your feelings, it'll all be fine. <laughs> However, um, uh, there, are, well, I'll, I'll stop, we could talk about sort of solutions to some of these later. But um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's there's that part of it. There's sort of survival in communities that are experiencing a lot of violence. Mm -hmm. I think also uh, boys of color and black boys in particular um, in their reporting in my book, they're just subjected to a different level. And this is part of our national conversation about policing and so on, subjected right. to a different level of um, of policing in their classrooms from the time that they're two and three years old. Uh, and then up through, you know, as they grow up, um, I talk to boys who do talk to me about, you know, feeling as if they are seen as threats um, rather than or sometimes seen as, you know, great basketball players. One boy told me, but not seen as artists or writers, not seen as their full selves. Um, and so, uh, you know, the um, final say, thing I'll say about race is you know, in the book, I write a lot about sort of the pressures that boys very much acknowledge they they feel right now around sexual uh, you know they understand that there's accountability for people who who um are sexually abusive or engage in sexual misconduct of some kind and they want the boys i was speaking to like they really want to do the right thing black boys i was speaking to are also really uh aware of the history of black men and boys being accused of sexual violence um falsely and are sort of i talked to many young boy you know black boys who are saying, I have to like really protect myself against being in any kind of situation where I could be, uh, where my, where I could be accused because, because of my race. So those are a couple, some of the layers that, um, that I talked to boys and researchers about. Right. And one of the chapters, uh, you spoke a lot about a program in Chicago, the CRED program, which reminded me a little bit of some of the work that Anita's trying to do here in the community of Arlington. Can you talk a little bit about the CRED program? Yeah, CRED is for, um, it's former uh, Education Secretary Arne Duncan runs CRED, and it is for young men um, who, you know, started out as a, as a broader group. I think now they're targeting uh, young men who have been gang involved in some way, who are at risk of being shot or shooting. And um, the idea is like to, help help these young men get the supports they need to get out of um, sort of the black market economy and into um, into jobs where they can uh, earn a living wage, um, get therapy and housing support and um, and, you know, sort of help young men get out of cycles of violence, um, including talking giving them space to talk about masculinity and understand the role that masculinity is playing, you know, ideas about masculinity are playing in their lives. A step back from CRED in middle and high school is a, a another program in Chicago that's been really successful um, that gives boys uh, a place to be in a group together and basically talk about what it is like to be a boy, what it is like to be them, what, they're, what challenges they're facing. 
and boys who went through it, it's called becoming a man told me that they it was like the was such a astonishing thing to walk in from the the halls of a school where everyone's acting cool everyone's acting tough and that this place where people could be real with each other you know cry together and share what's really going on with them mm-hmm. and that program i mean it it yes it gives boys place to talk about masculinity and think differently about masculinity it also has shown to be really effective at reducing um uh, violent arrest, uh, arrest for violent crime. So 50 per, boys who go through it, 50% less likely to commit or to be arrested for violent crime and 19% more likely to graduate from high school, which as a, a, a longtime education reporter, like I just never see uh, impact like that from programs. So it's incredible. Uh, Anita, did you uh, want to chime in again? No, I was just going to, I was thinking about our abuser intervention program. You know, we work with uh, largely men, although there are some women who have committed um, violence, domestic violence or intimate partner violence and have led them to be involved with the court then. And um, we have a program where, you know, we try and basically discuss the, the, the sources of their anger and violence and incorporating this kind of you know anal- understanding of what masculinity what we've been told mm-hmm. to be like as men uh would be really helpful so i'm i'm making note because i'm gonna contact those people <laughs> <laughs> that's terrific i'm wondering too emma you don't like the word uh or the phrase rather toxic masculinity so can you um Give us different language then for talking about that topic. Yeah, and first I'll explain why I don't use that term. And that and it's because in talking to boys and young men, they told me that they hate it. Um, not all of them, but many of them feel as if it's an attack on boys and men or masculinity in general. And I just felt like, you know, especially as me, a, a journalist approaching um, young people to talk about their lives, it it definitely didn't help me to start out using terminology that that sure. then they felt like they knew how I felt about them and they felt I was judging them. So, um, so yeah, I think if we're going to have these conversations and invite boys to have these conversations, uh, it helps to use words that they can hear and that they feel like is is, is helpful to them in, in kind of working through these questions and issues. So in the book, I use this term man box, as I mentioned before. Um, I also just, in talking with boys and young men, talk a lot about the pressures they face. And Anita, you mentioned the, you know, the sort of pressure cooker that a lot of young people are growing up in, in Arlington. And I think um, every kid has pressures facing them. And so it's a, you know, and a lot of the pressures that boys and girls face are based on gender norms in our culture. Um, not all of them, obviously, but um, that that is that is a I found to be a really good way into talking about um, these issues that doesn't feel like you're opening up a political conversation or judging anybody. It's just like I'm a human. I feel pressures. You're a human. You feel pressures. <laughs> Let's talk about them. Right. The um, the other concept that you that you hit on was something called uh, I think it was social citizenship, and or maybe I'm not getting sexual the sexual citizenship. Thank mm-hmm. you. And and again, could you describe a little bit about that term and where it's used, and and again how we might incorporate it into some of what we're doing in Arlington? Yeah. So uh, sexual citizenship is a term coined by two professors at Columbia who have a book called Sexual Citizens. Um, based on their research uh, about sexual violence on their campus. And it's a, the idea that uh, it's a sort of a framework for thinking about what ha- what we wanna give our kids as they're growing up. And what we want, I think, you know, the, the, we, we wanna make sure they understand that each person has um, self-determination over their own bodies um, and each person has dignity. And that means, you know, so that gives you a framework to talk about why why it's important to listen to somebody else and what they want. And also why it's important for you and why you have a right to um, express what you want in a sexual relationship. Um, so it's, I think it's a more uh, it's a more sort of comprehensive and perhaps empowering way to talk about uh, respectful relationships than just saying no means no or yes means yes. Right. Anita, anything to add? Well, I, I do think that 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 pressure in that mailbox of uh, 
having to, you know, be the pursuer and the conqueror or whatever and achieve a certain level of, uh, you know, sexual success at an early age is just a dynamic that sets both genders up for real, for failure, you know, or, or for a lot of people because, um, you know, the, the fact that women feel like they, you know, they're going to be put upon by the, 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 the exploits of, of males and the males who may not want to exploit but are pressured to do so because it's a sign that they're sort of achieving something in their young younghood and um it's just, i really think it's it's a it's such a sad dynamic that we've created you know? i'm glad i'm glad you brought that up because i think part of teaching sexual citizenship is making sure that boys understand that that um this stereotype that boys and men always want sex uh, is a false stereotype and that, you know, that to help take the pressure off them, as you say, to um, to score uh, or to sort of rack up, you know, hookups or whatever, which they feel, which they feel. Right. So you you did an incredible amount of research for the book. And uh, I was so struck you, you were clearly able to connect with the young men and establish a trusting relationship so that they could tell you what, what they were really thinking. So I applaud you for, for that. Uh, but I'm also like, what were what was the, the big aha as you finished the book for you on this journey, which started off as how to, how to relate better or how to raise my son that maybe I feel ill-equipped for, but you've now written this book. And what was like the key learning for you? Oh man, I think, uh, well, I, I mentioned at the top that one thing I mean, just coming to terms with how, uh, with the difficulties boys face and sort of realizing that my framework for thinking that girls' lives uh, or my life as a girl is so much harder than my brother's, for example, I have three brothers, is uh, a mistake. Um, that's one thing. Another thing was um, thinking about how um, a lot of what we teach boys is about how they should not be like girls and right. how it is, that is like the lowest thing you can be as a boy is to be something like a girl and how in some ways I think, you know, I, I have internalized that and even passed some of that on to my daughter. And so trying to unlearn that. So for example, you know, in the, in the passage I read, the thing that popped onto my tongue was to tell her to be strong and fearless was to tell her to be more quote unquote masculine, right? I mean, that's a message um, that I think a lot of us as girls and women have learned growing up is to be, you know, to be more, more like boys and to be more like men to make it in the world. And I want to teach her that, and I want to teach both my kids, right? My, my son and my daughter, that it is awesome. Femininity, the things that we call feminine are also awesome. Uh, being caring and nurturing, being gentle, being, um, you know, expressive and emotional, like those are really awesome things too. And so, uh, you know, at the end of the book, I wrote about how I want to teach them both not strong and fearless, but to be strong and gentle um, so that they understand that they can have access to these two, these two things that we talk about as if they're so separate, but we really, we need masculine, you know, quote unquote, masculinity and femininity um, in our lives in, in, you know, no matter what our gender is. Well, it's it's it was a terrific book, um, uh, an important book. Uh, as I said at the top, I enjoyed having conversations with both of my sons, uh, even though there were some reveals that I wasn't necessarily <laughs> expecting. Uh, like Anita, I have a very good relationship uh, with both of my sons, and I'm uh, so grateful that they're willing to talk to me and share, even if they uh, couldn't always, it's again, never too late to open a, a line of dialogue about some sensitive topics. And your book really gives very powerful examples, but also uh, a way in, so I really appreciate it. So again, because we're a library, what is the most recent book that you read that you can recommend? I am reading Fulfillment by Alec McGillis about Amazon and about sort of regional inequality in our country. And I recommend it. I'm in the middle of it, so I haven't finished it, but I think I can go ahead and recommend it. Okay. <laughs> and Anita? I'm actually reading a book called Allies and Advocates, Creating an Inclusive and Equitable Culture by Amber 
um, Cabral. And that's part of a mini book club we have in our department for our racial equity work. So okay. great. And I just finished Sherry Turkle's The Empathy Diaries, which is her continuing research in how we express ourselves with human emotions in a world where artificial intelligence and social media and people, people texting all the time seems to be the way of the world. A, a great, a great read and uh, gave me a lot to think about as this conversation did this afternoon too. So Anita, any last words for, for Emma? I feel like I've learned a lot, Emma, from reading your book. And it's it's a gift to all of us. It really is. And I'm going to I'm going to try and frame that strong and gentle. Put that framework on in my in my life. Yeah. So, thank and you. That, that's kitchen magnet material, Emma. So we might <laughs> have to get get on top of that. You know, the friends of the library, I'm sure, will want to want to help with something. But again, thank you to you both. Uh, it was a terrific conversation. Clearly, one we need to have. More often, the library, I think, can maybe get involved in being a safe space for hosting some of these conversations. So again, thank you for your time. Emma, thank you for your uh, wonderful book and for your gifts and for your reporting and your sensitivity. How old are the kids now? I'm trying my to remember. kids. My kids are almost four and almost seven. Uh, many, many, many bright years ahead. It's interesting at every age. Challenging. <laughs> Well, thank, thank you, you for having me. I really appreciate it. And I hope to see you soon at the library. Yes, indeed. It was terrific. Thank you both. Thank you so much.